Welcome to Dance to Heal. I'm your host, Jenny C. Cohen. Join me as I share stories of how dance and movement can bring healing in a way that is safe and tailored to your life. I'm a cancer survivor, mother of two, and an award-winning performer who found that movement was vital to my recovery. I created Dance to Heal Wellness and also authored the best-selling book, Outside in Recovery, Dancing My Way Back to Myself After Breast Cancer. I will bring new techniques to help you on your dance journey and healing path. Are you ready to move? Dance to Heal starts now. After working in the healthcare industry for almost two decades, Jackie Thomas saw how much nurses struggle to establish and maintain work-life balance. She helps nurses stress less to gain more peace, passion, and joy. So without further ado, welcome, Jackie. Thank you for agreeing to coming to talk. I am so honored you're here. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) So we know that you are the nurse's advocate, and I would just love for you to explain to the audience what exactly, in real talk now, okay, what's a nurse's actual responsibilities? I, we we do have these nightmare stories of clients, patients going into hospitals expecting this this um, high luxury care, and then there's a rude <laughs> awakening when we're like told no, <laughs> we're not going into a five star hotel. This is the hospital, mm-hmm. or long term care home, or whatever avenue that the, the nurse is working in for sure. So a nurse's job is to provide medical care, follow through doctor's orders, and do that in a safe manner. That also includes us using proper body mechanics and making sure we have proper lighting. And when we're administering medications or doing treatments and providing the care that the doctor has ordered, it is time consuming. It takes time for us, and there is a process for us to go through in order to make it safe for the patient who is on the receiving end. So I appreciate that patients are in their beds and they're in pain and they want that pain medication, for example, but we still have a process to go through in order to get that pain medication and check and make sure that we have the right one for the right patient, the right time, the right dose, all of those factor in before we're actually going to bring it to the patient at the bedside. And that takes time for us to achieve. Plus, you're not our only patient. (laughs) So that is the other factor because you're not the only one or the patient, you know, they're, they're not the only one who is asking us for a pain medication or toileting or whatever the need may be, right? How, how many, on average, I know it's different from facility to f- facility, how many patients or clients is a nurse in charge of on any given shift? It depends on where you work. I believe um, in the hospital, when I was a student, so I've never actually worked in a hospital myself in my career, but uh, uh, I was there as a student, and the ratio was about one to five, maybe four. Um, for each nurse. And in a long-term care home, um, for the, uh, the nurse who's administering the medications and treatments, the ratio is like 1 to 25. <gasps> and for a home care nurse going out and providing specific care to patients in their homes, uh, that list can be anywhere from one, like the one nurse has 10 patients to see in the day, up to 14, 15, 17 patients in the day. And they're driving around from home to home to provide the specific nursing care. Uh, And then I also worked in an endoscopy clinic where patients came to us for their scopes. And we were seeing, you know, anywhere usually from 10 to 30 people in a day. And that wasn't a one-to-one ratio because there was a process, but, you know, you're, you're working through... Uh, seeing anywhere from 10 to 30 patients in a day going through for their uh, their colonoscopy or gastroscopy sort of thing. So it, it's a lot. 
and and what it so just so we make sure because I know having been an occupational therapist in hospitals how much responsibility nurses carry and how much of their workload is really heavy could we just make sure that the audience understands what that mean you know when you have a patient what does that mean roughly for us muggles people outside of the nursing world what 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 does that mean you know what i mean so that cuz i already know you're in charge of scheduling and coordinating the actual medications of the client so they don't get the wrong ones there's no counter reactions making sure the the patient is stable medically and also oftentimes the doctors, you're you're kind of the backup for the doctors at the same time for every single patient, aren't you? Yeah, we are, right? Like we're the people on the front line dealing with and con- collecting the data from the patient. So that's vital signs, uh, that is assessing from head to toe, right? And that in itself is a process. You're looking at everything, their skin, their bowels, their mobility. You're looking at the whole picture, documenting all of that and sharing that information with the doctor. And that's just one piece. Like that's not even giving you the medication. I won't speak much about what it's like working in a hospital because that was me as a student like 15 years ago. But I can say in long-term care home, you know, the workload with one nurse to uh, administering medications to 25 residents. Well, like I said before, we have a process to go through for each medication for each patient. We have to know it's the right patient at the right time for the right route. And there's more. And we have to check all of that for every single resident. Now, in the morning med pass, when they're getting their meds, Each resident has anywhere from 10 to 20 medications. That's just the morning. And then they have more medications at lunchtime. There's fewer at at lunchtime, but you know, they're, you're giving out those medications. And then there's the afternoon shifts at four o'clock. There's a med pass there. And then again in the evening around eight o'clock. And that takes us the whole, the whole time, right? Like it takes, If you're not familiar with the unit, it will take you about two to three hours to do your med pass. And then you have to do treatment. So that is changing wound care dressings, uh, applying creams, and that is if nothing happens. So nobody falls, nobody codes, nobody's going downhill, nobody's palliative. We're just talking like a regular day of administering medications and providing treatments for the residents who live in, in that home area. And that's if you're familiar. If you're not familiar, a med pass is taking me up to four hours to do because I have to make sure I'm giving the right medication to the right person. And because it's in a long-term care home or it's the resident's home, they're not wearing that fancy bracelet that you wear in the hospital so that I can easily identify the person. No, there's this tiny little picture. (laughs) I'm supposed to figure out that this picture looks like this person. Uh, And sometimes the picture is spot on, but most of the times it is not. So it is very challenging to to try and figure out who's who and what to give to whom and making sure that you're giving the right person uh, the right treatment and right medication. That's, it's a huge challenge when you don't work on a specific unit frequently or haven't been there in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also let's be, let's be clear on something audience that's listening and watching this process of, 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 double checking and giving out the medication and there's other processes that Jackie hasn't gone through, right? These are not steps that Jackie says that Jackie has to do as a nurse. These are the facilities procedural things that she has to comply, correct? They're not things you made up. No, no. And it's, it's a part of, it's a part of the nursing process, right? Like we have ADPI, which is a nurse, a nursing assessment diagnosis, um, and moving forward with with that, right? But there is the the checks, and it's three checks. When it comes to the medications, uh, when I first graduated, it was five rights, and uh, making sure right person, right route, right time, right documentation, 
And of course, when I'm going on lists, I cannot remember all of them. <laughs> but I assure you, I know how to do my job. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing my checks yeah. on, a, on a consistent basis. But it's a lot. It's a lot to go through that. And, you know, that's, it's, that's just the regular meat and potatoes. That's not dealing with anything else on the unit when there's somebody has a fall or a resident is going downhill and they're declining or somebody has a seizure or, you know, there's so many other factors that could be going on, uh, on a day to day shift. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to also have us, so now that we have an understanding, right. Of, of this, behind the scenes story of what's really happening for a nurse when they step onto their shift. I, I want to talk about the shift for you as someone that works for hospitals. I know you don't work, you don't specifically work in hospitals, Jackie. However, you're speaking for nurses that work in hospitals and long-term care facilities. Mm -hmm. There has been this shift in healthcare, right? Where, Patients are, aren't patients, they're customers. Would you speak on that a little bit so that people can understand it's really, it's really, it, it's like for me, it, I equate it to flight attendants having to tell the main audience, we're not your flight attendant for service. We're your flight attendant for safety in the air. That's mm -hmm. what we're there for, you know, even though there were times historically they were dressed in short skirts, right? And made to appear a certain way. The bottom line is flight attendants are trained what to do when there's an emergency in the air. Well, thank you for clarifying that for me because I really had no idea because that is not the persona that I received as a person who has taken flight many times to go down south. It's like, oh, this is the one that's going to do the spiel at the beginning of the flight. And we all laugh and joke. And I've seen many memes and videos about that, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, and then they're going to give me peanuts and drinks at uh, during my flight. Right. So uh, and then answer any questions I may have or assist me with my baggage kind of thing, right? So it's great to clarify that. Uh, and as for healthcare workers, the customers, it has shifted. When I first started in healthcare 20 years ago, you know, I was taught in my schooling that we as the healthcare worker have the power and we have the power because we have the knowledge, skill and judgment to provide care for the vulnerable sector. This is still true. However, the shift has become that the patient is now a customer. So even though you know I'm providing care, what they want seems to be overriding that knowledge, skill, and judgment. For example, a person who has uh, COPD, chronic obstructive lung disease, their oxygen saturation should be around 88 to 92. So we typically will keep their oxygen levels low. They will be using nasal prongs or a mask uh, to receive oxygen. And, you know, we want to keep their oxygen level saturation around 88 to 92. But when they are feeling anxious or frustrated or they're saying, well, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I check the ox oxygen saturation and it's up around 98 and I'm like, you don't even need to have oxygen at all. Let's try you without it. No, no, I need you, I need you to turn it up. And I'm like, but you don't need it. <laughs> like you're, you're the science, the, the measurement of me knowing what your oxygen level is, is telling me you don't need the oxygen and me giving you more is actually contraindicated to your overall well-being. But if I don't give it to the person, then I'm wrong. Yes. It, 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 I, I just, and here's the thing, right? Because I've been on both ends with being in breast cancer treatment and also having worked in actual hospitals prior to my kids being born. I am like you. I can sit in the middle and go like, oh, wow, like here's a client who's in distress asking for what they think is going to make them feel better. And, you, and the nurse is going, you don't need it. It's actually going to make you feel worse. And mm -hmm. the adamant demand, right? Oh, no, 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 no. I know what's happening. It's in my body. And you're like, yes, you do know what's happening. And at the same time, you're making it worse. And sometimes I just, I love this story, Jackie, because for me, 
because I've had a healthy dose of respect for my nurses, <laughs> I, I learned very quickly on how to an occupational therapist in, in New York City that the nurses really ran the show. They kept the, the ship going. You know, they caught the things that fell through the loop. And that would oftentimes lean to, that would oftentimes leave nurses in burnout stage. Because mm -hmm. no one even understands how much you're responsible for, right? Now, I personally have only only ever had the best experiences with nurses because I don't expect them to be my personal like my personal person. Like, I'm just like, well, you have a job and thank you for keeping me safe. And would you please, could I bother you? <laughs> it's always how I start with my request. May I please have, do you have the time to type mm -hmm. of thing? I think it, it goes a long way in how one speaks to a nurse. You know, at the same time, nurses are burned out now, aren't they? They absolutely are. And I, like I was getting the shivers as you were simply making the statements of requesting to have what it is that you're wanting and needing from the nurse, because that is actually what brought me into nursing in the first place. I thought, you know what, what a great place to be where I can provide care for people and they really appreciate what I do. Now, my experience is that you're late my medications are late. And I'm like, well, what time do you usually get your medications? Eight o'clock, around eight o'clock. I'm like, it's only 840. I'm, I'm not sure what the issue is here. Well, you're late. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. You're like, what a, okay. According to you, you're late. <laughs> right. I, and you know, uh, I know, right. And, Cause audience, we always have a little pre-conversation prior to me hitting the record button for the interview, right? So, you know, would you speak on nurses having difficulty with being advocates for themselves? Nurses don't advocate for themselves. Nurses are so empathetic and caring for not only the people that they serve, but for their colleagues. And they will work Overtime, they will work extra shifts. They will come in on their days off in order to make sure that their fellow colleagues are not working short. But that's not conducive to providing good care because you're burning yourself out. You're not there. You're not taking the time for yourself to rest and revive yourself. And it's, it's sad. It's really sad that people are not taking the time for themselves to fill their own cup. And what's worse is that I've spoken to people in other healthcare um, fields, such as paramedics or social worker, and they are actually taught to do self-care for themselves. Nurses are not. We're not taught that. <laughs> Right. We're, we're not. I remember in my schooling, there was nothing in my schooling or education to teach me how to take care of myself so that I can continue taking care of the people. It's just put everybody else first, put everybody else first, put everybody else first. And that seems to be the, the mantra for for nurses is to put everybody else first. The big problem with that is you cannot draw blood from a stone and you cannot give from an empty cup. And especially after the pandemic, we're all giving from an empty cup. So if you're meeting nurses that are at their wits end and not smiling at you or being Miss Nicey Nice, that's why. It's, it's really why. They're just done. Oh, yeah, you're, you're grabbing my heart and squeezing it, Jackie. It's absolutely true, right? Nurses were on the front lines when a lot of us got to hide in our houses, you know, for safety, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're also trying not to spread the pandemic. <laughs> mm -hmm. so that was a little bit of a personal, like, <laughs> zing at myself. However, my point is that I love that you were willing to come on here and speak on this because, again, nurses have no advocates for them other than themselves. And I wanted to speak on this one thing you said, nurses give and give and give. And I, I would love for you to tell, to share a little bit of this other perspective because, you know, we know each other, right, from training that helps people heal from past unresolved traumas. 
And would you say there's a strong proponent of nurses that go into the healing and care field because they came from situations where that provides safety and that's kind of what they're repeating a little bit? I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, From my own personal experience, you know, uh, there's an archetype out there. Uh, There's many archetypes out there, but specifically for nurses, I would say it's the wounded healer. We are out there wanting to heal others in hopes that it's going to heal ourselves. Unfortunately, it doesn't really unless we do our own work. We got to do our own work and we got to take that time for ourselves so that we can heal ourselves. It doesn't mean you have to stop providing care and being the fabulous nurses that you all are, because I know how incredible you all are in everything that you do. But when you actually can heal the wounded healer from within and move forward from that, you are giving from a space of love and magic. And let me tell you, it's incredible. (laughs) It's so incredible to be on this other side of being so happy and joyful and feeling good pretty much on a daily basis. It doesn't mean I don't have bad days. It doesn't mean that I don't fall on hard times. That is a part of life for sure. You know, it's it's a roller coaster ride. Uh, we never get from point A to point D in a straight line, right? It's definitely not linear. Um, that's what makes life exciting and fun and and brings the joy. And I never used to thought that I was used to be so full of angry anger and frustration until I did my own healing work and moved forward uh, to bring me to where I am today, wanting to advocate for nurses so that they can see that there is a better way and that you can be giving from a full cup instead of trying to grasp at straws, trying to just draw blood from a stone, because it's not going to work. It, it, it isn't. I, I really loved you sharing that. Thank you, Jackie, because for myself also, because we, we met in the same training where we actually had to go through healing for ourselves before we could even begin to help guide others to where they need to be. And certainly for me, I went into occupational therapy, wanting to help people get to where they want type of training because from growing up it was it was safer for me to make sure I was of use than actually demanding any joy for myself and I love that you're giving anyone who's out there who's nursing or of a nursing type of profession that you really have to give yourself the 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 opportunity for joy Mm -hmm. it ripples out from that Jackie how can they continue to listen to you, what is their best way to be in touch with you, Jackie? I am offering a relaxation audio. It's about 15 minutes. So take some time for yourselves because you need it. You deserve it. You are worthy, worthy. <laughs> you are worthy. And it's, it's wonderful. It is relaxing. If it helps you put to put you to sleep, great. Uh, If you need it just for, you know, a simmer down and just to help you just relax for a little bit, uh, I am offering that uh, relaxation audio uh, for you. And uh, I really enjoyed it myself. I listened to it. (laughs) Beautiful, beautiful. So that link will be in the description of this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the description and also in the podcast, it'll be in the description. And uh, if you want to continue working with me, me, remember you can always access the free dance class that is somatically centered plus the mild fascia release at danceandheal.com. Jackie, thank you so much for coming and being so vulnerable because, you know, we really needed to understand how hard it is for nurses being this provider and also being human and that permission to do so. Thank you so much for our coming audience. Thank you for coming. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Dance to Heal with Jenny C. Cohen. Come back next time to hear stories of recovery through movement and learn more ways that you can move your body. To work with me and continue your journey, visit OutsideInRecovery.com. Are you ready to move?